Okay, let's let's start. Welcome back. Welcome to the afternoon session of day two of our conference workshop. Um, the next speaker is Tadej Trocha. Today is the head of ZSE Satsu Institute of Philosophy and uh, a research associate there. He also teaches at the Faculty of Arts of the University of Ljubljana. And today, well, he's a prolific writer, he's written uh, two books, and uh, also covering a series of different topics, uh, such as Freudian and Lacanian like psychoanalysis, of course, uh, but also Deleuze, Beckett, oh, and okay. he also is very active on a more openly political scene, and he tackled these issues such as uh, emergency, crisis, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, and if I recall correctly, also you were working on populism recently. Oh, hello. Did you? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> it's just that I don't call, don't use the term. Right? Okay. So, yeah, very much. Um, today is also a prolific uh, translator. He translated works by Freud uh, um, and Benjamin, right, into uh, Slovenian. And the uh, title of today's presentation today is The Case of Metapsychology. Thank you today. Yeah, thank you, Lorenzo. This was a great introduction. Um, so the title of my paper, as Lorenzo said, is rather short and rather vague, right? The Case of Metapsychology. Um, it's not a title, you know, given after the fact, but a, actually a, a direct record of this, of this basic vague idea before it was realized, or even before I had the slightest idea of how to proceed with this idea. It is more an epiphany, more of a, an Einfall, than an after the, fact, after the fact summary of some sort of a focused contemplation. The question, the, so the title is The Case of Metapsychology. The question that I'm starting with is the following. Can metapsychology be understood as a case in its own right? Can it be seen as a case that is in some sense analogous to Freud's major case studies? Is it possible and worthwhile to consider metapsychology as a case with a specific prehistory, with specific essential and less essential actors, with actors who should play an important role by status, but are in fact non-essential, and with some marginal bystanders who happen to occupy a key structural position? Does the project of metapsychology have its developmental phases where the next one never completely abolishes the previous one? Does it have its specific symptoms, its phantasmatics? And to shift perspective a little, can the author involved in the project of forming metapsychology be fascinated by it in the same way or a similar way that he or she is fascinated by a particularly interesting case as a person? Indeed, if an author, specifically Freud, is fascinated by the project of metapsychology, if he never lets it out of his hands, if he is possessed by it to a certain extent, I would say it is quite likely that it denotes a deeper tendency, which is on the one hand more abstract and more loose, on the, and on the other hand, more real and more binding. This tendency is articulated in its original form in Freud as a desire, of, uh, as a desire to simply engage in philosophy. Uh, let me be clear here, right? This tendency to become a philosopher in Freud is in no way the truth of Freud. Just as philosophy, I would say, is not the truth of psychoanalysis, and just as Lacan is not the truth of Freud, and just as Hegel is not the truth of Lacan. Yet the fact is that this tendency was directly expressed in Freud in his letters to Fleece precisely within the sphere, that is, where Freud typically wrote in a style that was a, uh, like a very peculiar mixture of some sort of deep confession and aestheticized abstraction. This is one more reason, I would say, not to take Freud at face value here. Okay, to specialists in history of psychoanalysis, these passages that I will quote 
are a commonplace, maybe even boring. Let me say, I hope they may be at least somewhat new to you, though. Okay, on New Year's Day, 1896, Freud wrote to Fleas, I see how, via the detour of medical practice, you are reaching your first, your first ideal of understanding human beings as a physiologist, just as I most secretly nourish the hope of arriving via these same paths at my initial goal of philosophy. For that is what I wanted originally when it was not yet at all clear to me to what end I was in the world. And again, only three months later, I quote, as a young man, I knew no longing other than for philosophical knowledge. And now I am about to fulfill it as I move from medicine to psychology. I became a therapist against my will." End of quote. Okay, much later, in the postscript to the Selbstdarstellung, written in 1935, that is the postscript, right? Freud once again returned to the idea of a detour that he mentioned in, in uh, connection to Fleece, right? And to his own history or his own projection of what he was about to become. As you will hear, the similarity between the 1896 and 1935 passages, which were pointed, this similarity was pointed out by Max Schur, Freud's physician from 1929 until his death in 1939. This similarity is, I would say, extremely fascinating. Psychoanalysis, which originated as a medical detour on the way to philosophy by Freud's own admission, at a certain point actually gave way to the initial tendency in its, let's say, uh, original form. This is a longer quote, so uh, please be patient. In the period of more than 10 years that has passed since 1923, I have never ceased my analytic work nor my writing, as is proved by the completion of the 12th volume of the German edition of my collected works. But I, myself, but I myself find that a significant change has come about. Threads which in the course of my development had become intertangled have now begun to separate. Interests which I had acquired in the later part of my life have receded, while the older and original ones became, became prominent once more. It is, true that in, it, uh, it is true that in this last deca decade, I have carried out some important pieces of analytic work, such as the revision of the problem of anxiety in my book, Inhibition, Sym Symptoms, and Anxiety, or the simple explanation of sexual fetishism, which I was able to make a year later. Nevertheless, it would be true to say that since I put forward my hypothesis of the existence of two classes of instinct, errors and the death instinct, and since I propose a division of the mental personality into an ego, a superego, and an id, I have made no further decisive contributions to psychoanalysis. Uh, this is from 1935, right? What I have written on the subject since then has been either unessential or would soon have been supplied by someone else. So psychoanalysis <laughs> could, could start to uh, be written by someone else. So this is the time to invent a new concept which are kind of so easy <laughs> that uh, they don't need Freud to be their author. Okay, I go on. This circumstance is connected with an alteration in myself with what might be described as a phase of regressive development. Okay, and this is uh, the, the important part of this quote, maybe the most important one. So, my interest, after making a lifelong detour through the natural sciences, medicine, and psychotherapy, returned to the cultural problems which had fascinated me long before when I was a youth scarcely old enough for thinking. <laughs> this, is, this is a great formulation. <laughs> okay, uh, and, uh, the last part. At the very climax of my psychoanalytic work in 1912, I had already attempted in totem and taboo to make use of the newly discovered findings of analysis in order to investigate the origins of religion and morality. I now carry this work a stage further in two later essays, The Future of an Illusion and Civilization and its Contents. I perceived ever more clearly that the events of human history, the interactions between human nature, cultural development, and the precipitates of primeval experiences, the most prominent example of which is religion, are no more than a reflection of the dynamic conflicts between the ego, the id, and the superego 
which, are psycho uh, which psychoanalysis studies in the individual, are the very same processes repeated upon a wider stage. In the future of an illusion expressed in essentially a negative valuation of religion, later I found a formula which did better justice to it. While granting that its power lies in the truth which it contains, I showed that that, that that truth was not a material, but a historical truth." End of quote. Okay, let's say, apart from the fact that this train of thought has survived almost uh, undistorted for almost 40 years, right? Apart from the fact that 40 years after the lines from the letter to Fleas, Freud still identified with the idea that much of his life was essentially a detour that his life was once of a wannabe philosopher who, in order to achieve his goal, took a detour through medicine, the natural sciences, and psychotherapy. Okay, apart from these two uh, facts, there are two other important points to be noted in this quotation. First, after the detour returned to the direct route, the initial goal was slightly modified. Philosophy or philosophical knowledge was replaced by Freud with the seemingly more vague but also more concrete label, cultural problems. Here, so he claims, it was his second topography of the psychic apparatus that enabled him to unravel the essence of culture, so rather with the help of an uh, already elaborated schema to identify the essence of culture as the reflection of individual processes on a wider stage. The second emphasis relates to the following sentence, to repeat it. I quote again, since I put forward my hypothesis of the existence of two classes of instinct, errors, and the death, that instinct, and since I propose a division of the mental personality into an ego, superego, and an id, I have made no further dec decisive contributions to psychoanalysis. What I have written on the subject since then has been either unessential or would soon have been supplied by someone else. Okay, the, re the retour to follow Freud's own suggestion occurred at a moment when the potential of metapsychology has been exhausted. Or more precisely, when metapsychological speculation on psychological processes at the level of, of the individual no longer necessarily led to further metapsychological speculation on psychological processes at the level of individual, but was instead applied to a broader social or cultural level. Okay, but it must be stressed, right? Even in the transposition of this schema to a higher or wider level, there remained an enigmatic, literally super essential excess of the essence of this schema in something event-like, something traumatic, which in this field is called historical truth, and which is captured in Totem and Taboo by the quotation from Goethe, of course, im Anfang war die Tat, right? Uh, Emily, you referred to it. Yes, uh, yesterday, right? By the way, this is also the reason why culture not only evolves, but contingently undergoes and cannot stop undergoing eventual ruptures, which are accompanied by the emergence of temporary collective formations, that is masses, groups, crowds, whatever you prefer to, uh, to say, which are not only added on top of the established social institutions, but embody in some way the splitting of society. Stand for society as a subject in the Lacanian sense of a society which for a certain interval of time behaves as a quasi-individual. I'm talking about a certain mass phenomena. You know, I, got, I always get this impression that when that masses actually do, do act as as individuals, I mean, with, with, they, they, I mean, with all the, with all the trauma, with all their naivety, with all their, um, I know, the, I know, caring for authority, um, for their sympathy, and uh, I don't know, stuff like this. From here, I can draw a tentative conclusion. Admittedly, the project of metapsychology as a detour of philosophy through psychoanalysis can achieve its limit and return to a certain form of philosophy. In Freud's case, primarily social philosophy or philosophy of culture, where its, where, where its essential findings are transformed into a specific methodological instrument, but nothing more. But even after metapsychological detour gave way to philosophy in this vague sense, it exposed a structural enigma analogous to that established by psychoanalysis at the individual level. There is the individual psychology, of course. There is the individual's unconscious. 
there are his symptoms, there are patterns that can be interpolated precisely because they are also found in so many other individuals. And there is something quite different in, 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 uh, in, in somebody's singular disposition, which may be superficially similar to that found in others, but which, like that of others, is inert and indissoluble. And the idea of the point of disposition, point at which disposition of an individual is formed, is what also returns in Freud's assessment of cultural dynamics. So with this transposition of, or this application of metapsychology, uh, which was supposed to be end the, you know, metapsychology and then we, that Freud would, would be able to return to some sort of vague philosophy, I mean, there is still something that, that, that stays. So the precise, this enigma which, which was unresolvable in some, in some way for Freud kind of drives this, this um, assessment, his assessments of cultural dynamics. Okay, Freud, Freud may not have been at the level of his name in this retour, in this return to philosophy. He may indeed have undergone a regressive development that he said, but we have to give him credit that even in this transition to the study of culture, he did not limit himself to the bare application of psychoanalysis. In other words, Freud did not repeat here, or did not want to repeat the mistake that he, at one point, reproached his fellow psychoanal psychoanalysts with when they gave up theorizing, when they gave up uh, further metapsychological speculation in the field, which represented one of the first attempts to establish a universal metapsychology for Freud, one of the many attempts, namely the theory of dreams, or the Traumdeutung, or the, the, the theory of dreams in this uh, wider sense. Uh, here's a quote from the new introductory lectures. This is an easy one, but kind of, kind of funny. Let us look through the volumes of the, international, uh, of, the inter, of the Internationale Zeitschrift für Ärztliche Psychoanalyse, in which since, 19, uh, since 1913, the authoritative writings in our field of work have been brought together. In the earlier volumes, you will find a recurrent section or heading on dream interpretation, containing numerous contributions on various points in the theory of dreams. But the further you go, the rarer do these contributions become, and finally, the section heading disappears completely. The analysts behave as though they had, no, they had no more to say about dreams, as though there was nothing more to be added to the theory of dreams. Everything's been said, right? And, um, and, um, and further, what has been called the dream, we shall describe as the text of the dream, or the manifest dream, and what we are looking for, what we suspect, so to say, of lying behind the dream, we should describe as the Latin dream thoughts. This is basic, right? Having done this, we can express our two tasks as follows. First, we have to transform the manifest dream into the latent one, and to explain how, in the dreamer's mind, the latter has become the former. The first portion is the practical task for which dream interpretation is responsible. It calls for a technique. The second portion is a theoretical tax, task, whose business is, it is to explain the hypothetical dream work, and it can only be a theory." End of quote. Theory, on, one can also call it metapsychology, also had a special object in this case. Some, some instant of inertia, something inert, something that cannot, could not be interpreted. I quote, uh, quote uh, Freud from 1923 in the remarks, on the mechanism of dream formation itself, on the dream work in the strict sense of the word, one never exercises any influence. Of that one may be quite sure. So there is something that, that um, uh, indivisible that, that, um, that doesn't want, is not susceptible for interpretation, does not respond. And it is precisely this moment of the inert and the indivisible that requires metapsychology, the production of new concepts, and which, in principle, calls into question its accomplishments. Okay, up to now, I have followed the first meaning of the title, right? The of the title, The Case of Metapsychology, i.e. metapsychology as a case. But the title can also be read in another way, following Freud's wager that there might be a case that could be the case of metapsychology, or rather, the case of metapsychology. That is a case 
as an embodiment of the proper object of metapsychology, the definitive example of the psychic apparatus. This, I think, uh, Adrian, you've spoken about in one of the responses, right? Indeed, in, Freud, in Freud's five major case histories, there is, a f there is a fragmentary but consistent train of thought concerning the potential of a single analytic case to serve as the ultimate case. The one a case that would give us crucial insights into the universal laws of the psychic apparatus while, return, while retaining its irreducible singularity. Freud's concern then is not at all with another, albeit upgraded, version of the quest for generalization of the particular, but with making the particular appear in its totality as the complete representation of the functional principles of any psychic apparatus. In the fragment of an analysis of a, case of a case of hysteria, the case history better known as Dora, this tendency is readily apparent, for Freud shows a case whose inherent characteristics would allow, or rather compel, the reader to focus attention on the structural dynamics of hysteria instead of dwelling on the spectacle of symptom formation. I quote here from, uh, from Dora. More interesting cases of hysteria have no doubt been published, says Freud, and they have very often been more carefully described. For nothing will be found in the following pages on the subject of stigmata, of cutaneous sensibility, limitation of the visual field, or similar matters. I may venture to remark, however, that all such collections of the strange and wonderful phenomena of hysteria have but slightly advanced our knowledge of a disease which still remains a great puzzle as ever. What is wanted is precisely an elucidation of the commonest cases and of their most frequent and typical symptoms." End of quote. At this stage, however, the general value of a single, even the commonest case, is still considered in Freud to be very limited. A single case is not only incapable of covering in toto the material which, with which psychoanalysis is concerned, it cannot, moreover, serve even as the ultimate case of a particular form of neurosis. So not only is there an ultimate case of case of, of psychic apparatus, but there is no ultimate case of hysteria even. A single case history, even if we were complete, even if it were complete and open to no doubt, cannot provide an answer to all the questions, this is a quote actually, arising out of the problem of hysteria. Oh, I wish I could, you know, write like this, so. but anyway. It cannot give an insight into all the types of this disorder, into all the forms of internal structure of the neurosis, into all the possible kinds of relation between the mental and the somatic which are to be found in hysteria. It is not fair, says Freud, to expect from a single case more than it can offer." End of quote. The two case histories that followed in 1909, Little Hans and the Ratman, or that were published then, represent two possible approaches to the further development of the strategy of minimal distortion established in Dora. In Little Hans, the epistemological wager of the case is strictly speaking a byproduct of the central therapeutic goal. By getting to the root of the neurosis at a time when it is still evolving and not yet uh, subject to various secondary mutations, the analyst may have found not only the easiest way to cure the existing uh, psychic affection, but also to prevent it from recurring in the future, thus giving the patient a lifelong immunity. So the idea was that if we cure Hans, uh, at, you know, when he was like four years old, or three and, uh, three and three quarters, or whatever it is, uh, if, we, if, if we, we, we were able to cure it back then, he will be like a, comp a completely psychologically healthy individual. In this way, however, Freud enters the zone where the foundation of the particular neurosis begins to appear as the possible foundation of every neurosis. So this is like the byproduct, right, of this, of this idea, of this, uh, of this will. I quote again, strictly speaking, says Freud, I learned nothing new from this analysis, nothing that I had not already been able to discover though often less distinctly and more indirectly from other patients analyzed at a more advanced age. But the neurosis of these other patients could in every instance be traced back to the same infantile complexes that were revealed behind Hans's phobia. I am therefore tempted to claim for this neurosis of childhood the significance of being a type and the model, 
and to suppose that the multiplicity of the phenomena of repression exhibited by neurosis and the abundance of their pathogenic material do not prevent their being derived from a very limited number of processes concerned with identical ideational complexes, end of quote. In contrast, the universal contribution of the rat man, the third uh, case, is not so much a product of Freud's deliberate quest for the possible universal origin of neurosis. Rather, it coincides with his assessment of, of obsessional neurosis as such, which is based primarily on the analysis of this particular case. The fact that obsessional neurosis is, I quote Freud, a dialect of the language of hysteria, which is more nearly related to the forms of expression adopted by, uh, by our conscious thought, and which does not involve the leap from a mental process to a somatic innovation, which can never be fully comprehensible to us, this brings with it an important advantage for the analyst, since, since it gives him unmediated access to the all, or better, to the not all, of the patient psychic apparatus. In consequence, the discussion of obsessional thinking would be, for Freud, I quote, of extraordinary value in its result, and would do more to clarify our ideas upon the nature of the conscious and the unconscious than any study of hysteria or the phenomena of hypnosis. So the obsessional thinking, the patient's obsessional thinking, right? It would be a most desirable thing if the philosophers and psychologists who develop brilliant theoretical views on the unconscious upon a basis of hearsay knowledge or from their own conventional definitions would first submit to the convincing impressions which may be gained from a first-hand study of the phenomena of obsessional thinking. I will only add here that in obsession neurosis, the unconscious mental processes occasionally break through into consciousness in their pure and undistorted form that such incursions may take place at every possible stage of the unconscious process of thought, and that at the moment of the incursion of the obsession ideas can, for the most part, be recognized as formations of very long standing. This accounts for the striking, cir striking circumstance that when the, ana when the analyst tries, with the patient's help, to discover the date of the first occurrence of an obsession idea, the patient is obliged to place it further and further back as the analysis proceeds and is constantly finding fresh first occasions for the appearance of the obsession." End of quote. In spite of all the objective advantages of obsession neurosis, so this total articulation of the mental processes in the mental sphere itself, discursive proximity between the conscious and the unconscious, occasional direct and, and undistorted intrusion of the unconscious into consciousness, virtually self-driven progression of the obsession idea towards its origin, in spite of all that, the fact remains that in the Ratman case history, Freud failed, as he put it, in completely penetrating the complicated, the complicated texture of a severe case of obsession neurosis, ostensibly because he gave priority to the practical goal of successful treatment. He liked Ratman too much you know, to, 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 to study on him, right? Just, okay, uh, uh, the last quote from, from the Ratman case. The patient recovered and his ordinary life began to assert its claims. There were many tasks before him which he had already neglected far too long and which were incompatible with the continuation of the treatment. I am not to be blamed, therefore, for this gap in the analysis. The scientific results of psychoanalysis are at present only a byproduct of its therapeutic aims. And for that reason, it is often just in those cases where treatment fails that most discoveries are made." End of quote. Having been, for obvious reasons, this is the fourth one, relieved of this dilemma in the Schreiber case, there was no analysis, right? We all know that. Freud seized the opportunity to reflect at length on the underlying mechanisms of symptom formation and repression, revisiting the key concept of fixation as a dispositional point, which is not only, as Freud said, the precursor and necessary condition of every repression, but also determines the, the manifestation of the failure of repression, repression, of eruption, of return of the repressed. 
This eruption, Freud argues, takes its start from the point of fixation, and it applies a regression of the libidinal development to that point. This uh, theoretical contribution is of critical importance because it establishes a direct bridge between the pre-subjective origin of the Neurosenwahl and the modes of its appearance in the present state. And it is precisely this bridge that would prepare the ground for the final great case history, the case of the Wolfman. In Wolfman, so this is the last one, we can find two explicit epistemological reflections. The first one, which appears in the last part of the text, adopts a standard tone, known from Dora. I quote, it is obvious that a case such as that, which is described in these pages, might be made an excuse for dragging into the discussion every one of the findings and problems of psychoanalysis. But this would be an endless and unjustifiable labor. It must be recognized that everything cannot be learned from a single case, and that everything cannot be decided by it. We must content ourselves with exploiting whatever it may happen to show most clearly. There are, in any case, narrow limits to what a psychoanalysis is called upon to explain. For while it, while it is its business to explain the striking symptoms by revealing their genesis, it is not its business to explain, but merely to describe the psychical mechanisms and instinctual processes to which one is led by that means. In order to derive fresh generalizations from what has thus been established with regard to the mechanisms and instincts, it would be essential to have at one's disposal numerous cases as thoroughly and deeply analyzed as the present one. At the end of history, we may find the, like, the, the answer to, the, to all the questions of psychoanalysis. But they are not easily to be had, says Freud, as Freud, and each one of them requires years of labor. So that advances in these spheres of knowledge must necessarily be slow. So very, like a very typical and academic right, take on, on, this, on this problem. In principle, nothing seems to have changed since the publication of Dora. As before, an individual case is regarded as having a limited potential of conveying a universally valid insight, right? And like any science, psychoanalysis must also be content with slow progress. However, the second reflection, which is part of Freud's reflection on this, on this problem, which is part of the introductory remarks, opens up a completely different perspective, I would say, regarding the epistemological and also ontological status of a single case. I quote here, naturally, a single case does not give us all the information that we should uh, like to have. Okay. Or, to put it more correctly, it might teach us everything if we were only in a position to make everything out. And if, and if we were not compelled by the inexperience of our own perception to content ourselves with a little. End of quote. Okay, not only this particular case implies Freud, but every possible case or any possible case that is every concrete manifestation of a psychic apparatus embodies the totality of the latter, potentially. And this is to be regarded in itself as the nucleus of all possible knowledge which psychoanalysis would ever be capable of gaining. So we really are unique and at the same time completely not unique, right? Um, Okay, not only this, let me, let, me, let me repeat this. Not only in this particular case, but every possible case, that is every concrete manifestation of a psychic apparatus embodies the totality of the latter and is to be regarded in itself as the nucleus of all possible knowledge which psychoanalysis would ever be capable of gaining if only the analysts were able to adjust their perceptual, perceptual faculties fully to the specific mode of appearance of this particular object. The conclusion, so, is in fact ambiguous, I would say. On the one hand, the evolution, the, this progress through five uh, cases, right, has confirmed the initial ambition that a single, case, a single example, a single case, can in principle capture what metapsychology typically aims for. So instead of working on metapsychology, one simple, one single example works as a psychic apparatus of, of the, presents the, the essence of the psychic apparatus. But on the other hand, with Wolfman, this attempt has also come to an end. 
and has translated itself, so to speak, directly into another strategy that Freud explicitly and now publicly also referred to as metapsychology. The year 1914, when the analysis of Vosmann ended, was also the beginning of a period of several years in which Freud pub published the first series of metapsychological writings, of course, but not only that, right? In these same years, he also published some key technical writings in which he is thinking in strict terms of the conditions of analytic treatment, a venture which in a loose sense can definitely be described as metapsychological as well, or at least metapsychoanalytic. Okay, for the, for the last part, I propose to ask directly, what is the object of metapsychology? What is the object that requires metapsychology? Okay, if I suggested earlier that the object of metapsychology is the psychic apparatus, what is it that the psychic apparatus produces in, materi in material, visible, and audible reality that can act as the material support of metapsychological speculation? What is it that the, that the hexe of metapsychology works its magic with? So, what this, you know, the, the, the metapsychology as the hexe, the witch, right? You know this famous quote. Okay, let us recall, well, so what is the, if, the, we have two, uh, two, two possible answers. So, the, the first one would be that the, the object of metapsychology is simply the psychic apparatus. But then there is another object, I would say, something that a psychic apparatus is capable to produce materially, that is visible, that is audible, and which uh, can, can be like the, 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 you know, the minimum material support of, of speculation. You know, how do we even know what's going on in this psychic apparatus? Because we cannot study ourselves, we cannot study other uh, people, right? Okay, let us recall the analysis of the Red Man, the most famous passage in this analysis when the Red Man reproduces the triggering moment of his great obsessive idea. I hope you will know the case. We have no time to, you know, to go into the details. Freud presents the difficulties that Red Man has in recapping a story told by the famous captain he dreaded about, a specific, especially horrible punishment used in the East from two aspects. So we can observe this, this struggles in two aspects. The, you know, the idea that, that rats were bored into, into, um, um, into um, uh, anus of, the, of, the, of a certain person. On the one hand, so, the overcoming of resistances triggers the unintelligibility of expression and the painful progression from one detail to the, of the narrative to the next. So he, Freud says, yeah, he, he struggled, you know, to, he, he, he made uh, like great pauses, you know, he didn't want to go on and say, no, 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 I, I cannot tell you, you know, let, okay, blah, blah, blah. just this, this usual stuff, right? Um, on the other hand, though, the resistances are granted their own plastic representation, their own really, really strange representation, they kind of illustration. I quote here, at all the more important moments while he was telling his story, his face took on a very strange composite expression. I could only interpret it as one of horror at pleasure of his own, of which he himself was unaware. You know this. A similar paradoxical scene expressing ambivalent jouissance can also be found at the opening of the text in which Eugen Bleuler, so no, not Breuer, but Bleuler, introduces the word itself. Not jouissance, of course, but <laughs> ambivalence, right? Um, I quote here, not from Freud, but from Bleuler. A mother has poisoned her child, but in retrospect, she is in despair over her deed. However, what strikes one's attention is that despite all the whistling and weeping, the mouth clearly laughs. Der Mund ganz deutlich lacht. The patient is unaware of this. Letzteres ist der Kranken unbewusst, he says. The mother who killed her child and now, despite her despair, laughs with the mouth, mit dem Munde lacht. She did not kill the child by accident, uh, by accident, but following a long struggle. Hence, she must have had a reason to kill the child. 
She does not love her husband, and she loathes this man's child. That is why she killed the child and is now laughing about it. But the child is also hers, and therefore she loves it and cries over its death. So we have two levels, right? The, the interpretation, the analysis of this, of this expression, um, which allows Bolle to, you know, to, um, to propose this, uh, um, um, the, the new term, ambivalence. But there is some, something more, right? On the very, uh, in the way this, this is presented, as well. so the, 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 the mouth that laughs, so the, the person itself, and even the face, even the words, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just, and, the, and the eye, and, so, and everything that's going on, it's, it's crying, it's, it's despair and everything, but the, the mouth laughs. A mouth which is laughing when the individual is whistling and weeping, this, I think, is what an object that calls for metapsychology looks like. So not the, maybe not the object of metapsychology, but the object that calls for metapsychology, that instigates metapsychology. And the point of psychoanalysis as a practice and even as a theory, in my opinion, is still today to perceive these kinds of signals and to dwell on them for a moment rather than preempt them with ready-made theories. And let me end with a quote from uh, Kafka from his diaries. I have been reading about Dickens. Is it so difficult and can, and can an outsider understand that you experience a story within yourselves from its beginning, from the distant point up to the approaching lo locomotives of steel, coal, and steam, and you don't abandon it even now, but want to be pursued by it and have time for it. Therefore, are pursued by it and of your own volition run before it wherever it may trust, stust, and wherever you may lure it. Okay, I can't understand it and can't believe it, says Kafka. I live only here and there in a small world in whose umlaut, stust, above, for instance, I lose my useless head for a moment. Okay, thank you. Thank you today for your presentation. So um, my question is, uh, is about the relationship between this minimal support of speculation you identify um, and the type of case history that, um, the, that Freud's written case for Schreber is, because th this is missing. There is, there is no, or at least I, actually I'm wondering if it is really missing on, on your assessment, if it is missing from the, the Schreber case. But in, in another sense, we could extend it not only from Freud's written text on Schreber, but also on the mid 20th century and even up to today, um, fascination with extracting something from literature or plays um, with a sort of psychoanalytic apparatus in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, and to try and say something about not just what is going on within a particular fabricated, well-designed, written product, but to also say something about uh, a theory, in a sense. Um, and, and this would be Schreber as well for Freud. Um, so my, my question is, if this minimal support of speculation is missing from a well-fabricated, i.e. sort of written text, in a sense, can it be the same type of case history that the rat man or the wolf man are for metapsychology? Are you referring to the Schreber's case? Or, uh, yes, yes. Huh. Well, th there is a lot to be fascinated about. First, you know, with, so for Freud, of course, one of the, one of the points he was fascinated, and one of the reasons I suppose he was fascinated about was, was, uh, was really banal, uh, that, that uh, Flixi, right, the Schreber's doctor was actually, the, I mean, uh, the, the one that plays a great part was actually the one that played a great part in Freud's early development. So in, in 1882, when he started working on, on uh, neurophysiology or whatever was it. Uh, but um, I don't really see why, why I mean, 
in, it's not a point that, you know, it's, 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 so I would say that in every case, something like this, just for it in order to be interested and not to be just, you know, like a typical, that something that you could say, yeah, this is a typical case of, uh, of this structure that we have already had, you know, uh, fixed. Uh, there is always something that appears, right? So it's, it, it, of course, it depends on the on the which Schreber. It's 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 his own writing, his own use of words. For instance, you know, his own. Uh, I was working on this, so uh, I can I can actually say that, that what what he was interested in. So and, and I would even even argue that this reason why why Freud here works in in the Schreber analysis with this. Uh, grammatical terms, right, of, uh, you know, uh, he loves me, he, blah, 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 I love him, he loves me, blah, blah, is actually is, der is derived from from, uh, from Schreber's use of, of the word wundern, right? Uh, to miracle, and uh, the way he says, so he's, he's not only uses this as sich, uh, like sich wundern, right? But he uses this as a description of what, what, the, what the upper, you know, the, the higher powers are doing on him, right? So th this is not a I'm sure that, uh, Moritz, you, you can uh, concur, right, that it is not usual for, for the German to use the word wunder in his way to, to, to miracle something to, uh, on anybody. So um, this is like a precise, you know, like a, in, in, in Schreber's writing, the starting point, I would say, for Freud to make a, a progress on, on this, for instance, you know, the, on the mechanism of projection. Uh, if, uh, can you just, maybe you can elaborate on your question. <laughs> well, then, if... <laughs> As we joked. Because what Schreber would have in common with a literary product, for example, yeah. is this sort of... And, and, and what is different from his case than from the Ratman or the Wolfman is that Ratman and Wolfman are speaking in, in situ, right? It's a bit improvised. They're not thinking about, you know, oh, what am I going to say? What are, what are the order of my ideas? Um, so what then would be transferable from, if anything, maybe there's nothing transferable, from the analysis of the Schreber case to the general psychoanalytic uptake of literary products or any written product? Oh, yeah, well, uh, maybe the, the, as far as metapsychology goes, so Schreber's case is from 1911, if I'm correct, right? Uh, and in the 1915, Trigon Tripschigzale, for instance, you know, he, and I'll still say this: this could be influenced by Schreber uh, when he uses this. Uh, you know, he makes the schema of a, of, uh, of a, of, you know, of, of ex exhibitionism, and you know, when then he can produce. I mean, this is crazy for for you know for a theorist in 1915 of Freudian uh, <laughs> of Freudian uh, level, right? To to say something like that, you know, uh, that we just have to turn it around. So I am what you know. He is observing. One penis and one penis is being observed by. I mean, just this is this is strange. I mean, so this is just the way to articulate what's going on, not only in on this uh, linguistic level, on the level of, you know, uh, on on the linguistic level, but also on the, at the level of the drive. So that there is a possible way to. I mean, for instance, Schreber's uh, paranoia and the way you know uh, of uh, let's say this this structure kind of condensed both those levels into uh, into a single one. Right, so maybe it's not it's not even uh, necessary that that you know that this I don't know fascination is already articulated in the you know in the first uh, level, like immediately right, but this is something that that in, in that kind of forces Freud to you know to work on his metapsychological project further and gains new new insight and, and stuff like this. So, but. Uh, but this, uh, so it's just the, 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 the what, what metapsychology studies is the psychic apparatus, right? So, and everything that, uh, so uh, it's, it's, it, it can be also more, you know, like it's not, it's not uh, necessary to be like this composite expression that we still are talking about and which is even difficult to, you know, translate, you know, when you have to say that from English, from German into Slovenian. I, 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 I mean, I'm checking this. It's, it's a very difficult formulation. So it's even, even on, at this level. But for instance, in the Ratman case, you know, the, the way that he, he um, mm, mm, which is a strange speculation, I would say, but, uh, you know, he said that, that uh, Ratman has a, has a, a has a specific ways of, of pronouncing uh, the, uh, the word uh, 
but Abba, right? That he uses, that he uh, pronounces it as Abba, in some sense, so that, that rings together with, with, uh, with uh, Abba, you know? So it's kind of um, implying that, that, you know, even the, that uh, Redman is also, you know, involved in this theory. But, you know, just, just to, to notice uh, uh, something like this, you know, and, and to pay attention, maybe, maybe just at the end, uh, you know, Maybe you, you can come to the, clus, the, to the conclusion that this, you know, leads to nowhere objectively, but you still have to. So not only, but whatever I was trying to say, I mean, more universally, this is something that, you know, for psychoanalysis, even in the political field, right, should be, should pay attention to some, you know, some forms of, uh, some forms of uh, events or, or some, you know, political structures or some political formations and to let them, you know, let them be observed for a while. And this may, may be the reason why I do not use the word populism. <laughs> so, right? Okay. I think that, uh, Maybe shall, shall finish, but I would like to ask a question to the co-organizer, and we open up the floor again. Um, one quick point. Um, it has to do with something which puzzled me a lot in the past reading Freud, and then a question. The quick point, historical truth, which I think originally is historische Wahrheit, right? That's a really tricky notion in, in Freud. Um, it's really crucial. I've been working on the future of an illusion, mm -hmm. and it's a really, really tricky notion, because what, I, 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 in your terms, I tend to say that Freud uses it when he has a case, positive case, for metapsychology, but he doesn't want to fall into metaphysics or a Weltanschau, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But I would like to hear your thoughts, because no, no, I, that, I agree. you yeah. know, it's never really, to the best of my knowledge, it's not taken as a central concept in Freud, and I think especially in the 20s, it is quite central. So mm. just a comment on your thoughts. The question, and here I'm being perhaps a bit too late Lacanian and critical Freud, your question, uh, what is the object of uh, metapsychology? And you had like two options, mm. and I think those two options could equally be mapped back onto Lacan, right? Mm, yeah. But Lacan would say there's also like a baddish Freud for whom the answer to the question, what is the object of metapsychology, is actually a Weltanschauung, that is to say, a cosmic, a, a, a description of cosmic principles. Mm -hmm. uh, or to simplify, ero, eros and thanatos. Okay. And this maybe goes back to the question of historical truth, because wouldn't you say that there is a kind of metaphysical, metapsychology in Freud precisely, especially in the beyond pleasure principle, whereas at the end of the day, he's doing precisely what he preaches against, that is to say, he constructs a cosmic Weltanschauung. Yeah, uh, I mean, in my opinion, I, I mean, just just as a, maybe it's a matter of taste, but this taste, I guess, has some you know has some grounding. Um, I always prefer the the the, the text from 915 and 914. I mean, to 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 the to the both famous one that came later, right? Because I kind of, but n but this is not not to say that you know that that you know the the. the Necessarily, that the ego, super ego, and you know, this the, and that drive is something like a cosmic, so now a cosmic principle, and, and blah blah blah. Eris, well, uh, it's, I wouldn't be so, you know, uh, I couldn't really say this. I mean, I'm not, I don't have any, any argument to, you know, to, 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 to say to say it like this. But, but what I liked, I always liked with with with. with um, with the texts, you know, also starting actually with the with the Schreber analysis, I would say, and then you know the the text from 1912, the 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 one on the technique, and uh, you know like, and then in 1914 uh, the um, remembering, repeating, working through, and even uh, the, con the the text from 1937, you know, the unendliche analyse on the construction and analysis, which are basically, you know, I, I'm I'm quite sure that they were written. In 1915, <laughs> right? They actually, kind of, or at least the, the the bigger part of this text had to be written back then because it's like a, it's actually a comment on Wolfman. So uh, it, it has the same, you know, the same spirit. If you if you compare it to, I don't know, this is, I mean, 
maybe he did, but as if, you know, he, was, he, he returned back to that, to that age. But, um, so the, what, uh, your question was that if, uh, whether meta, did I understand you correctly, whether metapsychology could... Whether there is a case for which uh, the object of metapsychology in Freud ends up being precisely what he doesn't want to do with metapsychology, that is to say, a Weltanschauung. And that, that the culprit there would allegedly be, from a Lacanian perspective, uh, beyond the pleasure principle, where it gives the impression, at least, to actually uh, present a coherent vision of the universe without gaps, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, if, if, if this is true, right? So uh, this, only, this only further supports this, you know, this, his, his own uh, self-reflection that in precisely after 1923, he returned back to studying cultural problems. So I managed, I returned back to my Weltanschauung, with which I was born. Right, I, I know what I'm saying. Or are we completely misunderstanding? No, I, I, we can talk about it. One yeah. thing is like, you know, uh, simplifying, diverting to the social cultural, cultural, whereby you inevitably, you know, promote some kind of like meta, meta psychologically based Weltanschauung. Another one is like, you're producing a kind of like first philosophy even a first philosophy of nature, mm -hmm. um, simplifying eros, thanatos, a substantialized notion of libido, blah, 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 whereby, in a sense, <clears throat> even within Freud, forget Lacan, forget a kind of like materialist critique mm -hmm. of that, you end up in Freud, Freud ends up contradicting his denunciation of bad philosophy because in a sense, you know, like beyond the pleasure principle is a book in first philosophy. So basically my point was to say, isn't there also like a bad metapsychology, a bad object of metapsychology? Oh yeah, of course, yeah. Why not? Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's human. <laughs> yeah, but the question would be, but Yeah, I mean, this is just, a, it's, it's, it's a difficult well, how task. How do you square up the two good acceptations you described with this one, which even for a Freudian, is not that good. Yeah, this was an, uh, just my, I mean, what are the potentials of metapsychology? This is what I was talking about all the time, yeah. yeah. But uh, as for historical truth, uh, the, the other question, right? Uh, I would, maybe I would just say that this concept, sh what, what, he, what it functions as is maybe we should better not translate it, but understand it as historicizing truth so the, precisely that's something that did, did not really happen, but that dynamizes all this uh, otherwise, you know, static uh, structures, and which is a, um, and then you, you can, we can talk about whether this is a, a construction, you know, where, wh whether what you get is a myth or whatever, but, you know, kind of work with it. But only just articulating the fact that, that um, you know, the, there is a, cultural development, but not as something that is already completely formed, just develops and grows, but that, you know, you have this dynamic principle that kind of lingers, and also in it, you know, you have this offsh offshoots as, you know, as groups, as, as, as I said, or maybe then some strange stuff can happen, so, within, within this development, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, that was really interesting. Um, it, you didn't mention the letter to Fleece that I did mention yesterday, that all uh, psychology is metapsychology. So I was wondering if, since I did mention it, I don't feel so bad mm -hmm. bringing it to the fore, um, you, we could potentially, or you uh, could square uh, this quotation doctrine, et cetera, with um, your aside about um, how the mass or the mass in psychology uh, acts or acts out mm -hmm. like an individual. It was an aside, but I thought it was very interesting. And maybe it could lead to uh, trying to articulate the relation between metapsychology and mass in psychology, or whether mass psychology is a misnomer. Um, well, uh, it, it, can you repeat this last part? <laughs> just, just the last sentence. Um, it's, 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 it's not very loud, so can Sorry, you, can yeah, you, whether yeah. you're aside about how the group or the mass functions or acts as an individual, and um, if you could say something about the relation between mass psychology and metapsychology, mm -hmm. or whether mass psychology to your mind is a misnomer. 
uh, no, uh, mass psychology, well, the, again, the potential of, uh, of mass psychology, right, coincides with what I was uh, talking about, you know, just, just before the, that this would, meta, ma, I mean, mass psychology works with something in the society that has this evento, I would say, event is of some sort of event of nature, right? Okay, you have these stable masses and, and stuff, but this is, I don't think this is an, a very interesting point in this, in this text, you know, talking about church and the army and blah, blah. And the, the, what I find interesting is that um, he, could, he could kind of, you know, I don't know, explain society as, a, as, as something that is, you know, like a product of these forces of Eros and Thanatos and, uh, you know, this, and even uh, relations that are organized in a way uh, that, that the individual psyche is organized and, and stuff like that, you know. But uh, the way the, I, I think the reason why he's, he's dealing with, with mass psychology, why he even wrote that, that text, was precisely that something has been, you know, there, there is a, re a residue of some sort. You know, just for, for Freud, even, what he, even for somebody who was not, as, as he talked about all the time, right, not very politically engaged or even interested in, in, in politics, or, or, but he was interested in society, uh, you know, <laughs> what's going on in society, and he, he could clearly see that something is lacking, right, that some things are, uh, are starting to boil even in the, you know, heard something about, let's say, something that recently then happened in Germany and, you know, it's starting to happen in Austria. So, uh, um, so it, it's, it's, it's maybe like an, as, as the, uh, the, the social and individual psycho psychology are connect us, connected, right, as, as he says in the introduction to, to the mass psychology, Paper or the book, uh, maybe we could we could we could argue that there is a certain branch of metapsychology that would be called mass psychology. I don't know if this answers to you, but you know. uh, I, th I think it's yeah. Well, th thank you uh, for that today, and I like Holden. Uh, you know, I have a question that has to do with the Schraber case, mm -hmm. um, it, but not for the same reasons, not so much that it was a written text that he was working with, but rather in terms of Freud's praise for Schraber and his, uh, you know, indication that, well, Schraber, if anything, instead of being an inmate of mm -hmm. a mental facility, should in fact be directing it um, and, you know, is indeed in a certain way, you know, a great psychological or psychiatric thinker. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it, it's, it, it, it's as though what Freud is indicating is that Schraber's incredibly elaborate but also horrifying delusional system um, is treated by Freud as though it were almost a direct, albeit with some picture thinking distortion, a kind of direct instantiation of the metapsychological apparatus of psychoanalysis mm -hmm. that now appears in this spectacular guise as the elaborate delusional mm -hmm. system. Um, and you know, it seems as though that indicates that well, this is a this is a case that perhaps even more so than the four other major case histories gets closest to being for you know an explicit direct instantiation at the level of a singular case of the universal categories and concepts of metapsychology. Um, and of course, it's also exceptional as a case in that it is the one instance of psychosis. I mean, despite the Wolfman's hallucinations, et cetera, that is still not you know, identifiable for Freud as, as, as psych psychosis, strictly speaking. So you have you know, four neurotic level psychopathological case studies, and then you have this fifth one of, a, of an instance of psychosis. Mm -hmm. And it's with the one that is the instance of psychosis where you get, you know, to use a little bit of, you know, Hegelese, where you have a case that seems to be most fully or closest to being the fullest version of a concrete universal that short circuits the distinction between, mm -hmm. you know, the universality of metapsychology and the singularity of the mm -hmm, case. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, would this be in line with the kind of line of argumentation that you know you're you're working with? And you know, and in line with this, though, why did you not opt for a treatment of Schreber? You know, given that it seems as though one could, like in the manner I'm suggesting here, you know, work it into what you lay out with respect to the four other case studies as you know instances and you know related to this, the question of would a case that really did close the gap between metapsychology and you know clinical singularity mm -hmm. would it necessarily have to show up in the guise of something that would be you know that would be psychotic mm -hmm. uh, you know since that's one of the distinctive features of the Schraber case as well well there is a simple reason why I skip this text because I I've been working too much on that text in, in the in the past, so it was actually so. The, the only reason I left it out is that, that, that it, would, it, would, it, would, it would take so long. It's just maybe my control of this, you know, of of, of opening, the, you know, the, the space for myself. Just to, because I could I could easily have written right or presented here the text that I, that that would simply be like the the case of meta psychology, and I would say, yeah, this is the Schreber's case. Yeah. So, <laughs> but uh, but then we would lose. I, I, I mean, yeah. This, but but would would such a you know would such a hypothesis, such a theory, uh, wouldn't it it would in my opinion close this question right, and then we we would just say so, so how can we go on from this you know just a, like an assertion okay we have like the one case the Schreiber case and everybody what would would everybody just study the Schreiber case or what I mean and here would if if that was our conclusion. Nevertheless, there was a still, and uh, even after uh, uh, Schreber's cases, and, and I don't think it's it's on Freud's side that you know that he kind of misjudged Schreber's case as being only a half half uh, ultimate case of of meta psychology. He went on. He, I mean, and uh, it's, and I would I would argue that it's easier to go on with, you know, following a person which was not psychotic. <laughs> so, you know, it's, uh, it, uh, you have to have some sense of reality. And Schreber did have a lot of sense for reality. I mean, what uh, uh, what I was fascinated the most, by, you know, with, in, in his work, right, in, in the in the memoirs, are actually the, the the appendix. You know, the the letters to the to the in, in, during the court battle, right? I mean, this is spectacular. I would say this is a, the, uh, these are the, the the moments that I would really say. I would let this guy to be a judge, you know. <laughs> this would be like the perfect, he's too smart to be left out. So um, there is some, some very uh, sound mind even in this, in this strange, bizarre, bizarre writing. And it's not, I mean, so yeah, this is the only reason. I, I, it would be totally counter my, my uh, you know, <laughs> what I wanted to say, that to make like a, no, 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 the four cases are interesting, but, uh, are interesting, but it's Schreiber's case. Uh, no, 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 no. Quite the obverse, I would say. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I would go back to, to what Lorenzo pointed out, this very Gunshawan uh, question. Mm. Um, I'll try to put it simply. Um, as I understood, you, you tried to show how metapsychology was some some in some way necessary to support um, the practical examples and also some in some sort of like necessity to philosophically and uh, scientifically um, um, support or acclaim um, his pra practical mm -hmm. endeavor. Um, but wouldn't you say, um, this is now my question, that um, through the texts like um, Beyond the Pleasure Principle and the Unconscious and the Ego and It, um, we see how Freud uh, deals with uh, his dualism he wouldn't um, uh, let go. Uh, uh, the dualism of the principles on the one hand and dualism of the drives on the other hand, and how he shifts and, um, you know, how he tries to adapt the theory to the practice, but at the end he ends up with eros thanatos, um, and uh, no matter how much he tries, 
uh, he cannot get the practical confirmation of the death drive. So at the end he says, um, like the Eros is probably the one who speaks a lot, who is loud and so on, and the dead wife is, is the one who is yeah, obviously precisely, silent. Precisely, yeah. But of course we can see it, I will just quickly elaborate a little bit more. Of course we can see the negativity of the analysis itself. The, uh, the negative, so the, the dead drive as Lacan took it out, is of course this negative moment which cannot be um, theorized, it cannot be like grabbed and so on. But still, when you say that at one, one point uh, the meta, meta psychology itself becomes some sort of necessity or compulsion of theory that tries to also, you know, um, affect the or affect the, the, the practical uh -huh. um, okay. uh, analysis. And like just short shift to Lacan, wouldn't you say that also Lacan takes this repetition compulsion, uh, that drive uh, connect and connects it to the real as some sort of theoretical principle um, for his Weltanschau. Mm -hmm. um, I referred to a, to a quote I wanted to include here, so. Uh, to answer your question, I, yeah. But first, I, of course, the, if if that drive could, you know, could be, could, you know, could if we could find like a, the the good example of that drive that we could that we could like hold it in our hands. I mean, the, of course, the, the, there is no that drive, you know, in in its concrete form, in the present, uh, total, totally present. But. Um, there is one one interesting quote. I think it's from the it's also from the Zebzdarstellung from 1925. He he's he's talking about that he he actually had no problem. So this is what uh, he had, he had no problems, right? You know, uh, getting the the theory of of the unconscious as as such directly from experience. So unconscious the the thesis of unconscious itself is something that we can actually get directly from from experience from observation. But then he says that when when we try to to do something within this unconscious and then uh, um, you know split the unconscious into unconscious and preconscious, then the problem you know this is where the problems start to 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 to, to appear. So it would be uh, now I, I will just quote here because it's a really good good quote. It would be more difficult to explain consciously concisely how it came about that psychoanalysis made a further distinction in the unconscious and separated it in, into a preconscious and an unconscious proper. And then he said, it will be sufficient to say that it appeared a legitimate, legitimate course to supplement the theories that were a direct expression of, a, of experience with hypotheses that were designed to facilitate the handling of the material and related to matters which could not be a subject of immediate observation. So we actually have two, you know, two kinds of theories. One, one, are, one are the, the ones that, come that, that are only translations of direct experience. And there, there are the ones who, who, who serve us to, you know, to get a better sight, to, to even ob be able to observe, to even see something in the direct experience. Um, and then he says, such, a, such ideas as these are part of a speculative superstructure of psychoanalysis, any portion of which can be abandoned or changed without loss or regret the moment its in inadequacy has been proved. So. Uh, Metapsychological concepts are not, you know, are not here for everything. Are not here to stay. We we can do without <laughs> eros and thanatos. Why, I don't know, why should we? It's not. Uh, the point is not that once we once we kind of get to this concept, oh, now we see there is the, there is eros and thanatos. This distinction has to stay, right? But th then uh, and then he said, but there is still plenty to be described that lies closer to actual experience. So, th what I wanted to say is that you have like two types. So you have like. Somehow he proceeds like this. You know, you have uh, the, the direct experience that that produces that produces one type of theory. Then you have the the more speculative theory that kind of it cannot be direct, cannot directly come from the observation, but from some paradoxes that show up in the observation. And when then now you can see like if, if it, at first it looks like okay this is the end, right? So, so we have these types of theory and the things that just pr proceed. So. And, and maybe there is even a, even a danger or a, or a kind of uh, 
Arabia, desire to, to get rid of the practice and then only stay in the theory and, and, and speculate without any material support. But that, what, this is the, so the third step that I call him right now, there is still, still plenty to be described that lies closer to actual experience. So he says, kind of always you have to return to the actual experience, the observations, something, you know, not to replace uh, the actual experience and its paradoxes that are included with speculations pure and simple, right? So I think this, maybe this answers all your questions, right? Yes. At least the one that you posed, <laughs> so. Uh, I think, yeah, I think we, yeah. One question for you both, or is it enough? Perhaps it is enough for okay. everybody. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yeah.